Welcome to the Feeling Loudly podcast, a show about human emotion and the way we navigate this life of trials and triggers and treasures with the help of astrology and tarot. I'm your host, Jana. I'm an astrologer, a tarot reader, and an Akashic Records reader, and I'm here to help you do this messy life with as much grace, ease, and pleasure as possible. Hi all, I just finished recording this episode and I just wanted to put a little content warning on it ahead of time that I do talk about health trauma and um, abuse on this episode and share a personal story. Welcome to day 12 of 22 Days of Tarot. Today's our Justice Day, card 10 of the Major Arcana. And today was kind of surreal, really interesting transition from the Wheel of Fortune yesterday, which felt kind of impersonal, and other folks commented in Discord that they have kind of an impersonal, detached relationship with the Wheel of Fortune too, and that's always been the case for me. But justice is interesting for me, because in many decks, justice and strength are swapped, so 8 and 11 are swapped. And so often justice comes through as card eight, and I kind of resonate with it at times as a soul card too, but it's similarly felt like very um, sterile to me. And so I was interested to see what would come up today. This card can feel a little severe at times. It's in the portals deck, it's a sword with um, scales that are hanging from, I think it's called like the hilt of the sword. And... The scales are a symbol of Libra, the sign that's connected to this card, and at the top of, like near the handle, is a white rose, and then there are two triangles with their broad ends, like, against each other, so it's forming like a diamond with two triangles, and then it's set against this sunset scene with this sort of mountainous range in the background and this fog, and it feels like we're in this this I don't know, this liminal space or this in-between space and you don't know if it's dusk or dawn and a lot of the messaging that's been coming through today around the equinox has been around that middle ground between beginnings and endings and justice being this commonly represented by the scales, by the Libran scales, is about balance and the sort of back and forth that we might engage with and Today felt really interesting as I was seeking a lot of truth today. (laughs) And the sword, the metaphorical sword can be a deliverer of truth and a sort of double-edged sword, how the truth can hurt when we receive it too. And I just, I've gotten a lot of like duos, like my oracle cards today were deja vu and there are two figures that are wearing the same outfit, but they're mirrored, mirrored outfits. Like one side is white, the other side is black. And they're in the reverse, like, (laughs) spot. They're swip-swapped. I'm trying to figure out how to articulate it for these two figures. And they're in the same position, but in mirrored positions. And then similarly, teachers came through as my second card. And teachers is two, it looks like deer, that are facing in a mirrored position. And so there's this real, like, the, the Libran mirror was really, really strong today. The scales, two scales, deja vu, the repetition of the past, teachers, these moments in time, often relationships that show us a lot about ourselves and that teach us through challenge and through uh, struggle and often through beauty and connection and, and joyful moments too. But it's, you know, typically it's it's harder moments that we see as teachable moments or or moments when we really learn, when we learn a lesson. And I pulled a clarifier card today because I was just curious, um, and I'll get into the prompt that we had, but the card that I got was the Nine of Swords. And so we had so much air energy coming through, so much air, the swords, justice. And the Nine of Swords can be about anxiety and feeling kind of trapped in the mind. And that has been something that I've been you know, I struggle on and off with anxiety, but it's been a little bit keyed up over the past couple weeks. And I've just been contemplating like, what is my pursuit of truth just kind of like a disservice to myself when I, again, like fixate on wanting answers to questions and um, 
that felt really pertinent as I was going into this exercise today. And so it was just on my mind. And then my offering that I made at my altar this morning to Jupiter, what was my offering? I'm actually having a hard time remembering what it was because this day, like time has been strange today. Time's been all warpy and confusing. What in the hell was my offering today? I have to pause and look. It was candle, 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 and service. Okay, yes. So the message about service came through really prominently from the get-go, and it felt like it was time for me to be of service in some way today. And then, not coincidentally, our prompt for today's card was, how can I support my community? And so there's this real call towards service with justice, and we can think about social justice, we can think about movements, and needing to kind of use our voice, swords, in order to cut through false narratives and kind of like puncture the veil of illusion and reveal the truth to people who need to see it. And that's something that I think has been extra potent since October, and, you know, watching a genocide play out, watching multiple genocides play out and needing to use our voices to eliminate truths and to keep truth front and center. And, you know, with the deja vu and the teacher's cards here, it's like, can the past is here to teach us lessons and we can choose to learn from the past and from these deja vu experiences that come back around, whether they're personal experiences or collective experiences, like what we're witnessing um, or we can continue to kind of bury our head in the sand and choose to not see and choose to stay in the comforting illusion that nods us to sleep, poisonous denial that keeps us complacent and keeps us stuck in a place of fear and ignorance, as opposed to opening up to the often painful truths that help us grow and evolve. And so that felt, you know, all felt <laughs> very here today and it wasn't a particularly like harsh day personally um but to be honest like I did not tune into the news at all today I like have been a little bit tuned out since going into this challenge because I've been kind of heads down um but the videos that I've been seeing and some of the horrors that have come across my feed today are extra horrifying and it when I sat with the question of how my community how I can support my community how I can be there for my community I got this acronym that came through, <laughs> EAT, E-A-T. It's been coming through over and over and over again for weeks. And finally, the other day, one of our one of our tarot humans, um, Avery, who's super awesome, was like, you know, this, this acronym reminded me of this like thing that Google was doing years ago where we had to focus on, um, I think it was like, what does EAT stand for? Um, it's like excellence authority 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 expertise authoritativeness and trustworthiness i should know this as a marketer human um but it's important for for seo search engine optimization anyway so avery was randomly like this is probably not what your guides are telling you but this made me think of this acronym that was like super in my brain years ago when i was doing this work and talking about EAT all the time, expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. And so these are very like justice keywords, expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. This need to kind of become disciplined and clear and honest and forthright and precise with the actions that we take. You think about if you were to wield a sword, you could like do a lot of damage with that. You could also give someone a little tiny scratch and it's all about the way that you wield it. It's about the way that you carry the weapon, not the weapon itself. And so there's something here about the mind being a similar weapon and also our voice having the potential to be a weapon or a warning. And how we use our voices makes a really significant difference in the way that the world reshapes around us. And so with justice and with deja vu and teachers, and I also got this gnosis card that I pulled from my archetypes deck later on today after our Akashic Records group ceremony, which was really powerful. 
and they usually are, but this is through my Patreon. I, I offer these um, monthly group Akashic Records readings where we open the records and we channel together and receive downloads for the group. And we can ask personal questions. And they're often like really, really, really potent because we have some very intuitive souls that are in my Patreon. And uh, just like, <laughs> yeah, a lot of truths and a lot of difficult truths too, but really really, yeah, powerful stuff that comes through. And tonight I pulled this Gnosis card after we wrapped up. And this is about innermost knowing mystic truths. And I'll go ahead and read it to you because it might contain some messages for y'all too. So Gnosis, true knowledge is not found in facts and figures and scholarly books on library shelves. Rather, Gnosis points to the deep and timeless archetypal wisdom that rises from the felt experience of having touched the unknown with every one of the senses. That bit reminds me of the Wheel of Fortune. Those who are drawn to Gnosis find themselves in esoteric studies, likely involving mysticism, alchemy, healing, or perhaps science. Knowing is their calling, not knowing is their job description. No matter how far the alchemists take their studies, they come to the ultimate conclusion that facts slip toward mystery and soon the mystery results in facts. This card signifies a knowing that is life-changing. Once you experience it, you are forever changed and become a guardian of Gnosis. The eternal mystery is calling you. Study your passion in the deepest way available to you. When light, it's about contemplating the mystery and unanswerable questions. And when dark or when shadow, it's over-intellectualizing and literalizing or asking others. And to go deeper, you can look up Bruce Nauman's The True Artist Helps the World by Revealing Mystic Truths. And then it says, those who say they know, don't. Those who say they don't know, know. And this card relates to the riddle and the shapeshifter. All concern themselves with revealing mystic truths. So truth, truth, truth. Justice is about truth. And again, it's about the way that we deliver it. We can, like, hand someone the truth in our palm with a little chocolate covered the strawberry. We can shove it in their face. We can stab them with it. We can kill them with it. We can save them with it. We can wrap them in a blanket with truth. We can deliver truth in so many different ways, but it's less often about the message itself and again, more about the delivery. And that's something that Libra as a sign really understands because Libra is often about diplomacy and having hard conversations with grace and courage and doing so in a way that honors the personhood of the person that you're speaking to and you know, aims for harmony, aims for understanding. And so seeing these duos again, imagery wise on the deja vu and the teacher's card just felt like there's this time travel element to this card right now where we're traveling back in time to understand the lessons from the past that we may not have fully grasped and that may be coming back around at this moment in time to reveal something new to us that we didn't glean when we first experienced them. And the deja vu card is, you know, it's obviously all about deja vu, um, but part of it is like, what, what is new that's appearing in your life and how does this contain sort of ingredients or like textures that remind you of the past and what was going on for you then and who were you becoming and who are you becoming now and who do you want to be? Asking these questions and trying to get truthful with ourselves is how we can also show up in our relationships more honestly. You know, like some of the gravest, not gravest, but like some of the most extreme betrayals that I've experienced have been when someone was lying to themselves, when someone was in denial and they could not admit something to me because they couldn't admit it to themselves. And I've been that person too. I've been in denial and I've, and I've kind of pulled the wool over my eyes and chosen to stay in that spot that feels cozy, but is actually deeply stagnant and those are moments when we can kind of choose to expand and like bite the bullet and open up to something that feels scary but could potentially ignite growth or it's the moment when we can turn away and again bury our head in the sand and choose complacency and choose denial and denial causes a whole fuck ton of pain like look at the way that so many zionists are denying the fact that there's a, that they're committing genocide 
like look at the look at the way that holocaust deniers exist in the world and go about living pretending that something catastrophic didn't happen because it supports their chosen reality and today coming back to the prompt when i asked the question about like how can i support my community it was by being someone who speaks truth and by being someone who confronts lies and deceit and dishonesty within myself the ways that I'm being dishonest with myself the ways that I'm pulling the wool over my eyes and how that is hiding something within me that's urging me (laughs) to reveal it or to like explore it and and see it myself um but that's doing a disservice when I can't be honest with myself about my deepest desires or my deepest wishes or what I'm feeling Like being emotionally honest is one of the bravest things that we can do in relationships and it's scary. It can be really scary, but it's also so much scarier to kind of live in a place of constant denial and suppression because that eats away at us internally over time. And that is happening at a collective scale as we witness multiple genocides unfolding as well as other catastrophic things occurring in this world. And the amount of energy that it takes to sustain denial is depleting and it's soul crushing in a way. And that's the type of work that can take years or that's the type of healing that can take years to do because coming out of a place of such deep denial that you've constructed a whole false reality around yourself to support that denial, it requires kind of taking it down brick by brick and examining what caused you to lay those bricks in the first place. And that can be some really hard stuff to sit with. Truth is no fucking, it's nothing to mess around with. And, um, you know, like I, I've had my fair share of denial experiences, like coming back to my last relationship, which I've talked about, I was in deep denial for a good portion of that relationship. And it caused me to almost lose my mind. Like I gaslit myself in addition to being gaslit. And I did that so that I could stay in a position that felt like temporarily comfortable. And because I loved this person and because I wanted to, you know, (laughs) at least I thought I wanted to like build a life with this person. And that has been the case in past relationships too. And in many different facets of life where something was haunting me for so long and truly making me sick. Like I became physically ill in the course of that relationship, broke out in like pretty gnarly eczema, had like a terrible like rash on my hand for months. And then when I left the relationship and left my job, my skin healed. (laughs) And the same thing happened to me years prior on the brink of my Saturn return when I was going through a health crisis and I had gone off of birth control and anxiety medication within the span of a month. I was working with an acupuncturist and I like came in with a bunch of like little random symptoms and stuff that I wanted support with. And as we kind of got deeper and deeper, she was like, you know, I think like eventually considering moving off of birth control and anxiety medication would be a good move for you since this stuff can do a lot of damage. And I was vaguely familiar I had had terrible experiences on on birth control and specifically the Mirena IUD and um I when I got that inserted which was a terrible experience when I was I think 25 ish 24 or 25 um I was young I had a boyfriend I wanted to like have sex with no condoms and not worry about taking a pill every day and I got it I got it because so many other people were getting it and I didn't look into the deeper issues surrounding Mirena and other forms of hormonal birth control I just you know chose ignorance at that point and then when I got it implanted I guess is the right word uh, I developed horrifying horrifying anxiety within probably six weeks and a very dear friend of mine had got hers in at the same time or within the same range of time and had the same experience and we talked to each other about it and even looked up studies about Mirena specifically and 
found all of this stuff online where people were talking about their like horrifying anxiety and other physical symptoms and other mental health issues that they were experiencing post insertion. But then I went to see my gynecologist and was like, I think this is giving me really bad anxiety. And she was like, there are no documents. There's, there's no evidence to support that it would be the Marina. We can take it out if you want to, but there's no evidence to support that. And so I bought it. I swallowed it whole and was like, well, this makes my life more convenient to have this little T-shaped, like, fucking, <laughs> I'm trying to come up with a proper diss to give the Marina because I hate that little piece of shit so much. Um, but I can't come up with something. So just use your imagination. But I, um, I chose to keep it in because it made my life more convenient in some ways. And instead of taking it out and like listening to my body, I ended up getting prescribed anxiety medication a month or two later by my primary. And so then I was on two different forms of medication, one to help with the symptoms that the other one had caused. And I went about my life and things were okay, but then like life changed. I ended that relationship. I moved to a new job, like, and my anxiety followed me. And then what also happened is I, out of nowhere, seemingly had a six week period where I was literally bleeding for six weeks. And it happened about a year and a half or two into the Mirena. I got an ultrasound. Everything looked good. They told me again, you can take it out, but there's there's really, you know, no documentation that, that this would be the cause and we can't see anything that might be wrong with you. And so again, I left that fucking thing in my body and the period ended. I kind of just kept going about my life. And then it must have been two years later, I finally met that acupuncturist and told her about this among the other symptoms I was experiencing. And she was like very like yikes about it. And so I started focusing on gut health and started learning about Chinese medicine and, um, and all sorts of holistic medicine. And really it was this like awakening moment where I was like, damn, this is so wild that all of this information exists out here, but so many people with vaginas are getting these things stuck up into their uteruses and having horrifying experiences, but people just what are not talking about it. And the more I learned, the more disturbed I was. And then I got my IUD removed like the day of my 28th birthday. Was it 28 or 27? And I entered this new solar return year and was really excited and feeling like it was going to be this healing moment where I was going to recover and kind of come back to baseline. But what instead happened is that my body went into what's called post birth control syndrome and kind of went into shock. And so I did it all fast and I was supporting my body, but it also was just a lot to handle after 10 years on birth control to rip it out of my system. And then a month later to go off of my anxiety medication. And I started feeling very weird and I developed really bad uh, eczema that started kind of breaking out gradually in different places all over my body, creeping, and small patches that got bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually I had like open wounds on my legs that didn't heal for months on end. And I got like a staph infection. I couldn't really do much. I eventually quit my job because it was too hard to go in and out from work when I had to be like bandaging my legs every single day and like covering up parts of my body. I, my hair was falling out. I lost my sex drive and I was dating someone at the time and our relationship was not good. And so I was simultaneously like really unhappy in this connection. And then we weren't having sex and like he was resentful over that. And I was resentful over a whole bunch of other shit. And that relationship eventually fell away. And then I was living in San Francisco at the time. And so I had like and I'd left my job, I'd started freelancing, left full-time work, and then left my relationship, and then eventually I left San Francisco. And by that point, my body was experiencing a whole slew of other symptoms, and I was on a very rigid diet, uh, elimination diet, trying to identify if there were triggers that were, like, setting off 
my internal alarm bells. I was seeing practitioners, doctors, uh, naturopaths, acupuncturists, allergists pretty much every single week I had an appointment and it was incredibly expensive and I ended up losing my life savings over the course of about two years, um, which wasn't much. Like I didn't have a whole bunch of money, but it was it was enough that I had saved up and it really was like kind of an atom bomb in my life. And so during that time, I ended up leaving San Francisco and moving to Oregon. And um, it was a place, it was a time when I needed to heal and I needed to get away from the culture in San Francisco where I felt like I was surrounded by people who were kind of just like chugging poison. And by that, I mean like it immersed in tech culture, um, really kind of like blindly saying yes to all tech advancements and like, um, and deep, deeply immersed in, in like capitalist mindset and innovation at the cost of humanity. And it felt very inhumane to walk around parts of San Francisco and see people with Google backpacks, like basically stepping over unhoused people on the street and like addicts and people who were suffering as they like got onto the Google bus in the Tenderloin or like in the mission. And it just was, it was, it was hitting me like a ton of bricks all at once that this life was so false to me and my body was screaming at me and I was moving through all sorts of childhood trauma that was kind of hitting me at the same time because that often happens when you go through physical stuff. It kind of brings up this stuff from the past and I was a kid who had a lot of who experienced a lot of illness as a child and it was my body's sort of like psychosomatic way of processing the shit that I was experiencing in my home as a kid, which was a lot of abuse. And so I share all this to say, and I should have put a content warning on this, so maybe I'll re-record a little, a little thing at the beginning. I was not planning on sharing this, but alas, we were talking about truth, so here we go. Um, so I was confronting a lot all at once and I felt like I was kind of at my wits end. My body was just in shambles and my hormones were so wildly out of whack that I didn't get a period this entire time. And so I went off of birth control. I had like one period and then for at least like a year and a half, I did not have a period. And I mean, things were dry down there. I was testing postmenopausal. I was like taking all sorts of, I was try, like taking natural estrogen and like trying to like initiate my cycle because I felt so deeply that that would help get everything else back on board. But it really caused me to confront all of these things that I had identified with, like my sexuality, like my body, like my beauty, like all of these parts of my identity that were really closely married to who I thought I was. And when I felt ugly and I felt unwanted and I felt like invisible to people who didn't see me when I wasn't like an object of fantasy, when I was instead like feeling really broken, it was really like it brought up a lot. <laughs> and, um, and I also was feeling this tension between the people in my life, my friends who I'd been friends with for ages who didn't really want to hear my story because I was shouting about it to, like at one point I was telling pretty much everyone I knew who was on birth control that like this is what was happening to me and people simply didn't want to hear it like I and I understand that it was a lot and I was not in like a great grounded state of mind so I was like really kind of like going off about it at times not often, but like, you know, there was, for an, for example, I once went to a book club in San Francisco with a bunch of women and we were, I don't, I don't do great in social settings like that often where it's like, let's, let's have a very like kind of proper conversation. And so we were sharing stuff and then someone asked me a question about like how I was doing. And then I went off onto this like tangent and talked all about what had happened and looking around at the women's faces were just like complete shock and then denial and then hearing them like make um, basically kind of try to make peace with the fact that they all many of them had IUDs themselves. And so they were like 
well, you know, my body's this way and I'm this way and I don't think that would happen to me because of this. And it was that feeling of like, I had fury that was coming up because I was like, I felt like I was pounding my head against the wall trying to get people to understand that this wasn't just a me problem, this was a huge problem. And that so many of us were having symptoms from other health issues covered up by birth control and covered up by anxiety medication and that the Western medicine model was slapping medication on top of deeply seated issues that needed other types of support. And so it was a whole awakening for me where I began to really see the world so differently. I was a kid who was raised on a lot of antibiotics and I had horrible gut health and I ate well and like I was, you know, I, whatever, <laughs> like I, I wasn't like I had an unhealthy life per se growing up, but I was also experiencing a lot of trauma and that really does a lot of damage to your body and to your soul. And so I was kind of paying the cost for that all at once. And it was on the brink again of my Saturn return and moving into my Saturn return in 2019 is when I finally got my period again. And after many, many months of diligent, obsessive meal planning and supplements and visits and studies and learning so, so much about the body and about hormones and about my body, I finally got my period when I went to a ceremony and I was surrounded by a bunch of witches. And it was my first time in a room with a whole bunch of women and in ceremony, in ritual. And I went home that night and I felt something shift within me and I woke up in the morning and there was blood in my underwear. And I've never been so happy to see my period after, like, again, it was like a year and a half. And I spent the next stretch of time really, like, getting getting back to some degree of baseline and that was late that was like fall of 2019 and then we sailed into covid just a few months later and i went through the whole ayahuasca experience that i've talked about a couple times now and so it was just a really intense period of my life and i guess i'm sharing all of this spontaneously a because i think it's important for people to like know that that's something that can happen and it's not something that's often talked about. In fact, it's something that the like medical providers will often gaslight us over and tell us that we're like out convince us that they know more about our bodies than we know about our bodies. And on paper, sure, of course. Like I'm gonna trust a doctor or a medical provider to tell me about my workup and like and treat me if I'm experiencing illness and experiencing whatever. Um but also, and I was speaking to a friend earlier about like intuitive protocols, um, there is deep wisdom that comes from our relationship with our bodies and deep truth that comes from our relationship with our bodies. And me going through that process was my return to truth, was my return to somatic knowing. I had an experience when I was kind of at the tail end of like the hellscape of eczema and everything that was really fucking me up and I'd come off of I was I was very traumatized from this experience like I was sleeping with gloves every night and hair ties wrapped around the wrists and like full like long sleeve shirts and pants with like ties around my ankles so that I couldn't scratch myself until I bled because that was happening and then it was like triggering cycles of infection and I just couldn't heal. My legs wouldn't heal. I was taking chlorine baths. I was doing Epsom salt baths. I was putting every substance imaginable onto my skin. And eventually I caved and did um, and tried topical steroids again to kind of get over the hump. And then that paired with a whole bunch of other stuff that I was doing helped finally like close the wounds so that I could actually heal. Um but like it was so much and I coming off of that experience learned so much about my own body and the signals that it sends me I learned that my body will be the first thing to get me out of a bad relationship the relationship I was in in San Francisco was very toxic and um, I didn't feel particularly safe in that connection and my body was screaming at me 
San Francisco, a city that I adore, but it had become unhealthy for me in the state that I was in and the job that I was in was unhealthy for me. And my body was telling me that all of these things I was putting in it were unhealthy for me. But I didn't listen until it screamed. And so one of the promises that I made to myself coming off of that experience was I'm no longer going to get to the scream. I'm going to listen to the whisper. I'm going to begin to hear the whisper and I'm going to begin to get silent so that I can hear it. And when I later was in the other relationship that I've mentioned, my last significant relationship, again, I started having that a rash come back. My hands started breaking out and I was in a job that was not good for me and I was in a relationship that was not good for me. And I knew at that point, but I still waited. I, I heard the whisper and I knew what it was, but I waited because conditions didn't seem to be supporting me in leaving either thing. And when I finally did leave, that's when my skin healed and that's when my body calmed down. That's when I was able to breathe again. <laughs> and it feels really important to share this because now I'm understanding this deja vu card and this teacher's card is like, when these experiences come back around, we need to listen to the body. The body is what tells us the truth. And the body will tell you if you are lying. The body will tell you if you're lying to yourself. The body will tell you if you're lying to your life by living in a false reality or by choosing to live in a false reality. And it's through the seeking of divine truth, coming back to the Gnosis card, that we begin to heal. Truth can heal. And again, it's like you can stab someone in the heart with it or you can offer them a flower. Speaking of this white rose, you can offer peace, you can offer resolve, you can offer resolution and closure. And sometimes that's just to yourself. But that recognition of truth and the courage that it takes to see the truth and to choose to live in truth is really big work and it's admirable and it's the work of leaders and that was coming back to the prompt was my ultimate message today was around leadership um i'm i'm someone who like embodies a leadership role in the work that i do and in the communities that i'm a part of and in my work and part of our exercise today was really beautiful our little intuitive exercise was to just step outside for three minutes and to just listen and pay attention and it was a it was fairly early when I was doing this I think it was like six or seven and so the the day was still quiet there wasn't a whole lot of activity but the second I stepped outside I saw a garbage truck and this garbage truck was the only vehicle that I saw and I heard these these people gathering like trash from dumpsters and collecting garbage and all of that and it just hit me in that moment that like the you know the people that support our lives quietly the workers who wake up early who tend to the streets the people who shovel snow in the winter the people who like like take the trash out are facing the truth of the world every day and seeing it and acting as leaders in this world, but they're often the people who get the least amount of spotlight. We see like politicians and celebrities and people who are all glittery and rich who are in the spotlight and seen as leaders. But in fact, it's these people who greet the day often so early. It's farmers who are planting and harvesting our food these are leaders. These are people who are leading life because they are providing for us. And there was this, this post that I saw. Um, who was it who even posted this? This episode is so long. <laughs> We're already at 40 minutes. Um, but you know what? Truth is truth can be long. Um, what was the post that I was seeing about Aries? Oh, it was beautiful. It was about... Um, it was by um, Ishpeming Astro, fantastic astrologer, and it was about Aries and the sun's exaltation in Aries being connected to the grandfather teaching of humility. 
And I will link the post below. It's it's really a beautiful reflection on leadership and essentially how leaders are people who are in service to community. And humility is a critical ingredient in healthy, sovereign leadership. And it's, yeah, anyway, you should go read it and you should go follow them. Um, it's really, really beautiful to conceptualize leadership as gentle, steady, and thoughtful and sort of being in reverence of community as opposed to like buoying and lifting the self up and making leadership all about the self because it's not. Leadership is about being in service. And so one of the ways that we can be of service is by serving. <laughs> I should say one of the ways we could be of service is by leading, by leading in our own lives and by leading with heart and leading with truth. And that can be hard it is not easy, but when we do, we set examples for the people around us and we set examples for ourselves of what we can do. And then our deja vu moments can become moments where we were really fucking proud of ourselves for the way that we navigated life. And so I want to end today with our song of the day. Okay, cut out there for a moment. Our song of the day is Lullaby by Atlas Bound. And I don't know this song very well, so I'm just going to read the lyrics and I'll see what comes through intuitively. Darling, not going to brainstorm vain wrong ways to hurt him because I don't believe in retribution, darling. Oh, you don't want, you don't want this voice of attraction working against you somewhere down in the future. Oh, surely we go on the plausible thing to do here. Hold on. You feel because I'm here. I'm going to stop you crying. Girl, I'm only trying. Hold on. You feel because I'm here. I'm going to stop you crying. I'm going to stop you crying. You're losing her. Why can't you help me provide what you know is good for her? But I think you're hiding the truth because you know it hurts. Pains me to say it. It hurts because you're never working. Working will get you somewhere down in the future. You're not helping anyone possibly changing our lives here. Hold on. Hold on, you feel, because I'm here. I'm going to stop you crying. Girl, I'm only trying. I'm going to stop you crying. So there's, we literally have the word truth in here, but I think you're hiding the truth because you know it hurts. And the line before that is, why can't you help me provide what you know is good for her? And it honestly, that, that feels like the truth and how we often conceal the truth from people because we think we're protecting them, but what we're really doing a lot of the time is protecting ourselves from being the version of us that would be pulled out into the light and seen if we were to reveal that truth to someone else. And so there's like, I mean, yeah, I'm rereading this. <laughs> it's like, of course. Um, but it's also this, this message around working against you somewhere down in the future like, again, that's the future deja vu. That's the moment down the line when you reflect on this moment that you're in now and realize that you took maybe not a wrong turn, but you took a turn that ended up creating a sort of wrinkle in time that you're now experiencing months, years, weeks, whatever, days down the line. And that sort of energetic ripple that we create when we make choices and choices have consequences and it's very, very justice to think about the long-term consequences of our choices and the way that living in denial is impacting our future as we speak. And that is the case personally, that's the case collectively. Living in denial is impacting our future as we speak. The longer we sit in denial over the gravity of the heinous crimes against humanity that we're witnessing, the more people are killed, the more people are maimed, the more people are tortured, the more our earth absorbs this heavy, like carcinogenic weight of hatred and vitriol and sickness that we're harming each other with every fucking day. And so like using our voices to speak truth is so important. And it's maybe one of the most important things that we can do if we want to be leaders in this lifetime is to speak truth and to get really fucking honest with ourselves, to get really, really honest with ourselves about where we are hiding and where we are shoving ourselves into corners to play small and stay safe 
or at least perceived safety uh, because we're too afraid to be seen. So being seen, telling the truth, doing the fucking thing, <laughs> I'm getting feisty. Um, but I really appreciate the way that these messages have come together. And I know like, again, I was not planning on taking this ride, but it crystallized. And so maybe I just need to do more long form podcasts and accept that I'm not a short form person. I want to lead you, lead you. <laughs> I want to lead you. I do want to lead you. Um, but what I do want to do is pull an Oracle card from the Offerings Oracle by Caitlin Grania to leave you with an offering for how you can be of service. Water. Mm. Feeling tired, sluggish, unclear. It's time to refresh the water glasses on your altar. Wash them well and fill them lovingly to the brim with cool water. Water is a conduit of spirit and flows through all realms. Water quenches our spirit's thirst and keeps our divination clear and consistent. Fresh, full glasses of water on the altar or boveda also improve our own energy levels and lift mental fog. Engage in water divination or spend time near natural bodies of water. It may be beneficial at this time. Be sure to drink plenty of water yourself, dear. So let's bring in the water, baby. We've been talking air and... Maybe we could all use some extra water, some extra gulps, and some clean, fresh glasses of water on our altars to help us kind of get the support that we need in order to face the truth. All right. Love to you all. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye. Mm -hmm.